Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for coming this morning, uh, braving the Marine Marathon and the many road closures that we had. I was explaining to Dr. Cho that I expected we might have a, a little bit more of an intimate group this morning. Uh, we had a, an intimate group at 9 o'clock service, so thank you very much for coming. It's a delight again to um, introduce uh, Dr. Cho. He's Assistant Professor of Hebrew Scriptures at Wesley Seminary. Uh, he was with us last week and began a conversation on Abraham, the long journey, uh, the journey of faith and the long response. And he's continuing that with part two this morning and picking up particularly with uh, the near sacrifice or binding of Isaac. So thank you very much, Dr. Cho. Like a morning, there's a handout coming around. It's just a collection of texts that we will be visiting today. Um, glad to be here with you again. And I think, so certainly it's very fitting that it's in a more intimate group because the topic is very intimate uh, today. Last week, we, uh, we looked at, uh, to a certain extent, the entirety of the Abraham narratives from Genesis 12 to 22. It continues a little longer, but from 12 to 22, and I tried to demonstrate that the entirety of the Abraham cycle can be uh, analyzed as a as chiastic in structure. That is to say, it progresses A, B, C, D, and traces back from D, C, B, A. I think that's the right order. <laughs> uh, and, and I think, and we so we and the kind of the primary conclusion was that the journey that begins in chapter 12 with uh, God's call to Abraham to uh, leave his country, his, 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 his family and his uh, homeland uh, to go to somewhere that he, God, will, God promises to show him a little bit later, that that journey only comes to its climax and its conclusion in chapter 22, where God uh, gives a very similar uh, kind of command to Abraham. So we'll begin with that link, and then we will actually kind of I thought we would just read through chapter 22, uh, uh, fill some qu any questions that we might have, uh, make some points, observations along the way. And for the second half of our time together, we can look at some of the, the interpretive traditions that have arisen uh, out of chapter 22 uh, in Judaism, in Christianity, and uh, very little uh, in, in Islam. So, it's just a revisit. So we'll read chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, can I have a volunteer to read that for us? Please, thank you. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, and your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Thank you. So we, with that in mind, uh, let's read the first uh, two verses of Genesis 22. And I'll read this. After these things, God tested Abraham. So the name change has already happened. He said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And this is uh, in Hebrew, hineni, which means, here I am. I'm ready. I'm listening. I'm, I'm ready to do whatever you call me to do. So it's... Uh, it's more than here I am. It's I'm ready uh, kind of a statement. He said, Abraham said, uh, God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And this, God gets more specific as the narrative goes along. First is take your son, uh, take your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And this mirrors the threefold description of the place that Abraham is to leave. So in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Go forth from your country, your kindred, your father's house. So mirroring the, 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 thri the three times description of the place that Abraham is to live, uh, leave behind is now in chapter 22, the, the thrice repeated uh, description of what uh, Abraham is to take now. Your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And here, God is making sure 
uh, kind of emphasize the fact that this is a precious son. Uh, your son, and go forth to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So the same language of, I'm going to show you where you're supposed to go ultimately. And, and this echoes uh, the same language that is used in chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, Leave your father's house to, to the land that I will show you. So there is this uh, echoing of the themes that we find in chapter 12 and chapter 22 again. Uh, so in, in reality, the call that God gives in chapter 12 comes to a culmination in chapter 22. And whereas in chapter 12, Abraham was called to go forth to uh, inherit this blessing, to become a great nation, uh, a great, uh, have make a great name, and be, uh, become fruitful and abundant. Now, in chapter 22, God is doing something quite odd. That is to say, God is asking Abraham to take the very son through whom God has promised to make uh, Abraham into a great nation and say, now sacrifice that son. That is to say, not sacrifice just the son himself, but really sacrifice your blessing, sacrifice your future, sacrifice something that is more dear to you than probably your own very life. And so, so, so underlying this is not only the length of time that has passed and the, the kind of devotion that Abraham has had to show, but also the heart-wrenching uh, sacrifice that is being asked of Abraham. If those of you who are familiar with this story will, will know that we don't know what Abraham is thinking. There's no sense of the depth dimension of Abraham's psyche. Uh, uh, a very famous um, uh, a German uh, literary scholar of Jewish background, he uh, wrote a book called Mimesis. And in, in, the, in the first opening chapter of that book, he compares this chapter, chapter 22, Genesis 22, uh, and uh, uh, Homer's Odyssey, and says that in Odyssey, everything is on the surface, everything is expressed. So you know exactly what they're thinking, what, they're, uh, what they uh, are being reminded of. But here in Genesis, this is, uh, nothing, nothing is expressed. Everything is left in the background. So he, so he described this text as, as fraught with background. And so it invites us to enter into this scene, this uh, scenario, and be, begin to imagine what it might have, been, might have felt like uh, and to and to really take on the journey with Abraham in this very uh, economical and terse description of the narrative. Um, so we'll, we'll go along. Uh, if can somebody can fi follow, uh, continue to read it with chapter 22, verse 3. So Abraham. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. So we can stop right there. And just, just to note, you know, people have wondered, what does it mean? What does Abraham mean that he will go up, we will worship, and then we will come back to you. But does Abraham already believe somehow that Isaac will be spared? Does he not intend, in fact, to, uh, uh, to sacrifice Isaac? Since he says, we will come back. Um, or, is it, or is Abraham just lying, perhaps to his servants? It's like, no, I, I know you're going to try to stop me. If I tell you the truth, and you know how, I'm, how much I love Isaac. If I tell you that I'm going to go and sacrifice Isaac, maybe you're going to, you know, mad, you know, uh, strangle me and stop me from doing it because obviously you're a young man, right? Uh, and I'm a world advanced in years and I won't be able to stop it. So maybe he's lying to get them off his back. Or maybe he's lying to his son, Isaac, who seems to not know what's going on, that he is actually the one who's going to be sacrificed. But perhaps also, uh, it's possible that Abraham is lying to himself because he cannot, at, as yet, face 
the truth of what he is about to do, or what he's going to attempt uh, to do. Uh, so even in those words, we will come back to you. Is it, is it a statement of faith? Or is it a psychological buffer that he is creating for himself or for his others? Um, let's continue with verse 6. If somebody else picked up there. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Okay, thank you. I think if you imagine this scene, can't help but imagine the deep sense of pain and, and pathos that Abraham must have felt, laying the very wood that he plans to burn his son with on the son's back. Uh, and, and I think it's, and, and of course the question, Father, in any, my, my son, here I am, my son, in responding to uh, his son with the same words, the same kind of stance, same kind of readiness uh, with which he uh, uh, responded to God's calling. Here I am, my son. And this, when, when, the, when the son asked, the fire and the wood, they're here, I'm carrying the wood, you had a fire, but where's the lamb? Where's the lamb for the burnt off? Um, and Abraham said, again, distancing, himself perhaps from the reality into which he's walking. God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And then here is this, this sentence. So the two of them walked on together. Right? This is a repetition of what we find at the end of verse th uh, 6. Right? The ver uh, end of verse 6, so the two of them walked on together as they left the, uh, the two servants behind. And now after this conversation, filled with unarticulated pathos, sadness. <coughs> They're also working together. And we notice that the, the biblical narrative is quite terse. It is very economical. It doesn't repeat. At least in this chapter, there's very few repetition. So what does it mean for the author to say, so the two of them walked on together? People have wondered, what has changed? Has something, is, it, is the walking together now of a different quality? at the second time. Does Isaac perhaps begin to understand what is going on? So now they're not only physically together, but also maybe mentally and spiritually together. So these are the type of questions that we might ask when we see so the two of them walk together. And of course, the fact that they walk together here will under, uh, underline the fact that they don't walk together at the end. And we'll come back and uh, come to that uh, at the end. They don't, they don't walk, come back down together. In fact, Abraham seems to be down alone, um, which is a, a, quite an odd detail. Verse 9, if somebody can pick up there. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and he laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. Okay, thank you. Um, so here the action kind of speeds up. Uh, we have action, 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 action. Verse 9, uh, they came to a place, Abraham built an altar. I don't know how long it takes to build an altar, but I'm assuming that it takes more than, uh, it probably takes a, a little bit of time. And then he laid the wood in order, he, organ he, he built the altar, put the uh, wood there, and then he bound Isaac uh, and uh, laid him on top of the altar, on top of the wood. And so the first verse, verse 9, kind of uh, accelerates the, the narrative speed. Perhaps these are just kind of flashbacks, maybe just snapshots of what is going on. And verse 10, right, in, in, in modern cinematographic uh, terms, now the, it's, it's a slow motion. Things are slow way down. Then Abraham reached out his hand 
and took the knife to kill his son. He could have simply said, um, Abraham sacrificed his son, but after this kind of speeding forward in chapter uh, verse 9, when it's slowing down in verse uh, 10. Uh, so that we ourselves, the readers, also recognize that we've come to something important, to the pinnacle, to the, uh, to the apex of the narrative uh, terrain. Verse 11, if somebody can follow, uh, continue there. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Continue, yeah. Twelve. Twelve, yeah. Twelve. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Thank you. Um, angel appears, um, and here we have God stopping Abraham from performing uh, the act. Um, we continue here. Uh, it said, 13, And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Uh, Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering and said, of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. Uh, as it is uh, said to this day, on the, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be uh, provided. Uh, so Abraham uh, is stopped by God, uh, sees that there is a ram caught in the uh, in a thicket, uh, and then he go, he really quickly sacrifices uh, the, the ram. Uh, there is no slowing down, but quick action. And Abraham names that place as the Lord will provide, the Lord sees, the Lord will uh, see, or the Lord will look to it, or uh, provide. On the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. If you can read uh, 15 to 19, the last paragraph. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord. Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young man, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Thank you. So we have here a via affirmation of God's blessing, which we saw already in chapter 12. And whereas in chapter 12 we have God freely, unexpectedly, graciously appearing before God, uh, before Abraham, or Abraham at this point, we have here on the, the very opposite of that picture, right? Uh, we have Abraham, Abraham being blessed once again, or, or confirmed in his blessedness, because he has done something. So we have grace in chapter 12, and if you wish, in chapter 22, we have something like work, something like merit, uh, because you have done this in chapter uh, verse 16, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will indeed bless you, etc. Uh, so, so what seemed like what seemed like a kind of arbitrary unfairness in terms of God choosing Abraham out of the, the, uh, the thousands and millions of people. Uh, here, to a certain extent, Abraham demonstrates that he is indeed worthy of the blessing that he has already received. Um, and you can also say that here is Abraham uh, who demonstrates uh, that he merits uh, this, uh, this blessing. And this merit is of such a great uh, worth that not only himself but his his descendants from generation to generation will be blessed because of this uh, what he has done um, and what he has done is described as you have not withheld your son your only son and that language will be important uh, when we come to the New Testament uh, particularly to Romans uh, where God does not 
withhold his son. Uh, so um, the way in which we understand God in the New Testament mirrors uh, the, the picture of Abraham that we have in chapter 22. Um, of also some interesting note is verse 19 where Abraham returned to his young man. It's not Abraham and Isaac, uh, but it's just Abraham returned to his young man. And they arose and went together to Beersheba. So the, so the fact that Isaac is missing here has led some people to speculate whether there was a version of the story uh, that was not uh, preserved in which Isaac was indeed sacrificed. Uh, so, so there is, uh, there has, but I think that's utterly speculative. It's possible, but it's speculative. Uh, uh, but it is odd, at least, that Abraham here, when, when we know that Isaac and I, when it's said twice that Abraham and Isaac went together in the beginning of the story, to have just Abraham come down uh, seems to be an odd thing uh, that uh, that, are, that, uh, that the rabbinic tradition uh, will have. A lot of, uh, uh, I guess, fun. <laughs> uh, for example, she says, uh, you know, Abraham just sent him off to study Torah, right? And he's like, now that we've done everything we need, you go off to prep school and uh, uh, and, and, and be on your way. So, oh, so things like this. So it is an interesting thing, but there, that's what it what we have. We can spend a lot more time with just these uh, this chapter, uh, but I really want to s see that. That the call to faith, or the call to obedience, as we might call it, is not only long for Abraham within Abraham's lifetime, but is indeed long in the history of the world, the history of, the history of religions. Uh, because this narrative, chapter 22, has uh, very important implications in Judaism, also and also in Christianity, uh, and in a different way in Islam as well. And we just want to take snapshots at this. We won't be able to delve into these implications and the interpretive traditions, uh, but I think it will be important to uh, just, just to see that the, the response uh, that, the, that, it, that the call of Abraham has called forth uh, is an ongoing response. So already in the first implication is that the place where Abraham sacrifices the ram in place of Isaac, or where Abraham nearly sacrifices Isaac, becomes to be identified with the, te the temple site in Jerusalem. And this happens already in, uh, in the Bible itself, in 2 Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, uh, it reads, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Where? On Mount Moriah. Where the Lord had appeared to his father David, the place that David had designated, the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So, Chronicles was probably a very late book, uh, written uh, much later than uh, the books of Samuel and the books of Kings, uh, in which we first find, meet Solomon and Saul uh, and David. Uh, but, but already within biblical Israel, in, in the biblical tradition, we have the Jerusalem temple site being identified with Mount, Mor Mount Moriah, where Abraham sacrificed, or nearly sacrificed, uh, his son Isaac. This means that uh, Abraham is the first priest, to a certain extent. Abraham is the first person to, uh, ought to sacrifice uh, on, in the temple uh, in Jerusalem, where all sacrifice, all legitimate sacrifices within uh, the biblical tradition are to be given. And this is important because this is even before Mount Sinai, where God reveals to Moses uh, the ways in which you're supposed to do sacrifice, uh, sacrifices properly. So, and, there, and this effort to connect the temple, the sacrifices, and, and, all, and many of the subsequent kind of uh, traditions within Israelite religion to back to Abraham is an ongoing thing. And this, to a certain extent, tells us that Abraham uh, continues to gain in importance, grow in importance uh, within, Ju uh, within Ju uh, Judaism. So the temple and sacrifice uh, is being connected to Abraham, but more than that, more than that is, is going to be, uh, is to be uh, connected to Abraham. 
Because Abraham and, and the binding of Isaac or the near sacrifice of Isaac will be also uh, be related to very important uh, festivals, uh, holidays uh, in, in, in Judaism. The first one is Passover. Uh, in the book of Jubilees, which is a second century uh, BCE, uh, kind of rewriting of Genesis and part of Exodus, Abraham becomes the first one to institute the Passover, even before the Passover actually happens. Uh, and this is, this, to a certain extent, it makes analogical sense, uh, because Abraham is able to substitute a, a lamb, a sheep, for his uh, son, and so also in Passover, in the Exodus tradition, uh, uh, sheep, the slaughter of sheep is substituted for the slaughtering of the firstborn of all the Israelites. So there's analogical uh, significance there. Uh, but this, this connection with Passover uh, between Abraham, uh, between the uh, binding of Isaac and Passover kind of fades within Judaism. But it does uh, leave uh, some traces. And this is the Mirkhata de Rabbi Ishmael. Uh, this is uh, uh, the commentary on the book of Exodus. And it says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's from Exodus 12, 13. I see the blood of the binding of Isaac. So when I see the Passover lamb being slaughtered, I see the sacrifice of Isaac, or the, or the blood of the binding of Isaac. For it is said, and Abraham named that site Adonai Yireh, the Lord will see. The Lord, you know, in our translation, the Lord will provide. Further on, it says, God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to uh, wreak havoc, uh, destruction, the Lord saw and renounced further punishment. What did he see? He saw the blood of the binding of Isaac. As it, as it is written, God will see to the sheep. So there is here a recognition that somehow, when God sees the blood of the binding of Isaac, God turns away from destructive uh, from destruction uh, to actually to something like redemption. Uh, and this is, in fact, what we find being more and more emphasized, emphasized throughout uh, the interpretive tradition of Isaac and the binding of Isaac, where Isaac somehow mediates God's grace. Whenever God remembers the binding of Isaac, God turns from the principle of, uh, principle of justice to the principle of mercy and grace. And this is what we find uh, in 29.9. Thus, when the descendants of Isaac became involved in transgression and bad deeds, may you remember for their benefit the binding of Isaac and leave the throne of judgment for the throne of mercy. And filled with compassion for them, may you have mercy upon them and change the attribute of justice to the attribute of mercy for their benefit when uh, in the seventh day. Uh, this is a prayer uh, that is usually read uh, during Rosh Hashanah, during the New Year festival, which lasts 10 years. And the culminating event is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Uh, so during those 10 days, uh, prayers are uh, given for the cleansing of the sins of the people of Israel, uh, uh, for the Jewish people. Uh, and so, one of the one of the texts that they read is in fact Genesis 22. On the second day of Rosh Hashanah, uh, they uh, the Jews will the Jews uh, to this day uh, read uh, the chapter 22 on the second day, and this is one of the prayers. And here is kind of begins to we uh, begin to realize that somehow Isaac or uh, Abraham's obedience uh, during the binding of Isaac becomes. The, the kind of depository of merit that allows for God to forgive the sins of, uh, of Abraham's descendants. So God turns from the attribute of justice to the attribute of mercy. The third important uh, consequence uh, in interpretive tradition is that Isaac becomes a model martyr. Isaac, in the biblical tradition, we don't know what age he was. He might have been very young, he might have been older, uh, but in later Jewish, uh, in, in Jewish tradition, Isaac becomes 25 years old, 
33 years old. So a full self-awareness. And there, a tradition develops in which Isaac, in fact, was a willing sacrifice. He was willing to die. He was a willing martyr. Uh, and so, uh, especially after the uh, Antiochian uh, persecution of the Jews in the, uh, in the second century BCE under the Seleucids, uh, uh, Isaac is interpreted again and again as a willing sacrifice. So not, it's not only Abraham who is the hero of the story, but also Isaac who is willing to die uh, for, uh, for obedience. So here in four, four Maccabees we have most amazing indeed, though he was, this is Eleazar, an, old, uh, an older uh, Jewish man who is being killed for uh, refusing to eat pork and sacrifice to idols. Most amazing indeed, though he, Eleazar, was an old man, his body no longer tense and firm, his muscles flabby, his sinews feeble. He became young again in spirit through reason, and by reason like that of Isaac, he rendered the many-headed wreck ineffective. O man of blessed age and of venerable gray hair and of law-abiding life, whom the faithful seal of death has perfected. So here Eliezer, who becomes a model martyr, is said to be able to do so, to, to go to martyrdom, um, by reason like that of Isaac. And so the whole tradition of Isaac as a willing martyr, who to a certain extent uh, encourages uh, others to do the same, uh, is reflected in four Maccabees. So in Judaism, we have the temple being connected to the binding of Isaac. We have festivals being binded, uh, uh, connected to the binding of Isaac. And we have the, somehow the binding of Isaac being, the way, being a treasury of merits by which God can turn from justice to mercy, to forgiveness of sins. Uh, and also we have Isaac becoming a martyr. And these themes are, in fact, themes that we also find in the New Testament. And obviously, uh, this time, we will be connected to uh, Jesus. So in John 1.29, uh, we, uh, we have Jesus becoming the Paschal Lamb. Right? Here is the Lamb of God who, took, who takes away the sin of the world. And if you remember that Isaac was... Uh, was connected to, to the Passover. Jesus is connected to the Passover, especially in the Gospel of John. In the Synoptic Gospels, uh, the, the Lord, the Last Supper, takes on the day of the first day of Passover. In the Gospel of John, the crucifixion takes place on Passover, which which imply that Jesus is slaughtered, is crucified as at the same time that Paschal lambs are being slaughtered. So the identification between Jesus and the Paschal lamb uh, is, uh, is, is very close. And throughout John, of course, Jesus is called the beloved, you know, uh, the beloved Son of God. Listen to him, uh, you know, um, for I am well pleased with him. Um, so we have that tradition. And I think I forgot to put, put one thing there where Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 32, I, it's not in your handout. It reads, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, right, but, gave, uh, but gave him up for us all, will he not with him also give us everything else? So God, to a certain extent, is, in, is reinterpreted or understood through the lens of what Abraham did. Uh, in, the, in, in the binding of Isaac in chapter 22 in Genesis. And Jesus becomes now the Isaac, who is the paschal lamb, who is the willing martyr, and through whose death, through his, whose blood, uh, sins are forgiven. So we have in these things, uh, in Christianity, Jesus, the relationship between Jesus and God, uh, God being modeled, being seen to be interpreted uh, through the lens of the, um, uh, the binding of Isaac narrative. Um, I think I think we need to end there. Um, so uh, we can read over the other other uh, passages and then go through them next year.